focusing in on the church of the Thessalonians. And so we can say this, that the church of the Thessalonians, they were a remarkable church. And so throughout the letter we have in front of us, we've worked through the, the first three chapters. We see that Paul is doing something. Again and again, he heaps up praise. And so we saw that Paul rejoiced over how these Christians received the word of the gospel. He said this in chapter 2, verse 13, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. He then rejoiced over their sincerity and, and zeal for God. Paul said in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Paul then rejoiced over their perseverance. There was persecution and resistance, and these believers, they stayed the course even in the midst of that. And so Paul rejoiced, saying, chapter 1, verse 6, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Paul rejoiced over their work. These Christians, with energy, with ambition, they took the word of the gospel and they began to spread it throughout the whole of their region, Macedonia and Achaia and beyond. And so Paul says, chapter 1, verse 8, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. And he rejoices over their spiritual fruit. He began the letter with these words, chapter 1, verse 3. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can say this, I think safely, the Thessalonian church was a remarkable church. And we should use superlatives here to describe this church. They were remarkable, first rate, first class, what a church ought to be, what a church ought to look like. That was the, the Thessalonian church. And Paul confirms this. In chapter 1, verse 7, Paul, I think, gives the highest compliment to any church in the New Testament. He says this, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And Paul is saying, this is what a church ought to look like. Now I start here rehearsing all of Paul's praise through chapters one through three for a simple reason. That these descriptions of this church, the Thessalonian church would do something to you, namely that these descriptions would awaken a hunger within your soul. That as you think over all that Paul said about these believers, your soul would respond saying something like this, I want that. I, I want that. I want to be a church like that. I want my life and my energy wrapped up in something like that. I want this church, this congregation, this people, this Fort William Baptist Church to resemble Paul's words here. And so if our hearts are working properly, a spiritual appetite should be awakened when we listen to Paul talk about this church. But it's here I want to get practical and I want to ask a question. How? How does this sort of thing happen? How does a church become a church like that? Well, as we think about that question, how, our eyes should immediately go heavenward. As we rehearse and remember all that Paul said about this church in chapters 1 through 3, we automatically should look to God. The Thessalonians received the word of the gospel. Why? Because of God. He opened their hearts and he made them receptive to the truth of the gospel. The Thessalonians lived with sincerity and zeal for God. Why? Why? Because of God, he showed them that their idols were nothing but wood and rock and metal. He revealed himself to them as the living and true God. He, through the preaching of the gospel, persuaded their hearts that there was only one Savior who could save them from the coming wrath to come, Jesus himself. The Thessalonians endured and they persevered. Why? Because of God. God kept them. It was his hand who was upon them. The Thessalonians worked, and they worked with energy and ambition, spreading the word of the gospel literally everywhere in their region. And why? Because of God. It was God's spirit that was animating and indwelling and empowering and blessing all that they did. The Thessalonians had faith and hope and love, and we asked how. How? 
Well, because of God. God authored every single good fruit we see in their lives. And so that's our, our, our theological instinct, and that's a good instinct. We immediately point to God as we think about this question, but, but here's the thing, I still don't think that answers the question. Pointing to God only adds another layer to the question. The question still stands how, and now we can add to it. When God shows up in his power, in his love, in his mercy, how does he make a church like the one we see in the pages of 1 Thessalonians? When God shows up, what do his people start doing? When God's power and grace and mercy are operative, what does it look like in a congregation of God's people? So, that's the big setup for our text. So would you turn your attention to chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. So, in these verses, we find four commands, and, and Paul lists off these four commands in quick succession, and I think these four commands in these four verses give us some of the answers to our question. So I want to set all of these commands before you before we do anything else. So look at your Bible and start with me at verse 10. Paul gives his first command. He says this, but we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. So Paul here in verse 10 is commanding them to do something more. And what does he want more of? Well, we just look up at verses 9 and 10, and he wants these people to give themselves over to more love. They're already loving, and now Paul wants to see an increase in love among these people. So there's our first command, and we can move on to the next verse, and in verse 11, we find three commands. Paul starts with this, aspire to live quietly. So Paul commands these Thessalonians to have ambition, to be full of desire for something, and that something is quiet living. The idea here is not silence, that Christians shouldn't speak up or use their voices. Rather, what Paul has in mind as he says this is an orderly life. Christians shouldn't have loose tongues or intemperate spirits. They shouldn't be troublemakers. They shouldn't cause chaos wherever they go. Next, Paul joins to the second commandment, a third. He says, mind your own affairs. So you might be tempted to hear a scolding here. Mind your own business. Perhaps you can, you can think of your older sibling just giving you the verbal stiff arm, keeping you away. But I don't think Paul is scolding these Christians. Rather, he is doing this. He is directing these believers to focus intently on the task that God has given them to do. Mind your own affairs. And as we turn to the last commandment that Paul gives, we find what one of those tasks are. Paul says, work with your hands as we instructed you. And so very simply, these Christians must not be a burden to the church or to others. They must not live off of others. Instead, they must find employment, get to work, and provide for themselves and for others. So there we have four commands in these four verses. Now, just let that sink in for a moment. So here we have this exemplary church. Here we have this church that God has powerfully worked in, a, a church that has accomplished all of these extraordinary things. We know all of it through chapters one through three. And here in these four verses, we find these four commands, and these are the marching orders that Paul gives to this church. Love one another. Live quietly. Mind yourself. Work. Now just let that sink in. These are not the sort of instructions that we expect to hear. We expect that this extraordinary church would receive some extraordinary commands, perhaps like cross an ocean or, or climb a mountain or start a giant revival rally in the middle of town or maybe at the very least in the midst of these instructions we would hear an adjective like the word radical or something like that. But we don't find that in these commands, nothing like that. What does he do? He, he focuses our attention on the mundane and the ordinary. He says to these believers, love one another. Live quietly. Mind yourself. Work. In fact, if you broaden out your gaze and look at the whole of the letter of 1 Thessalonians, all that you really find is the mundane and the ordinary. Paul spends a bunch of time in this letter talking about his own ministry among the Thessalonians, and Paul's ministry was mundane and ordinary. What did Paul do? He tells us that he worked with his hands and he reiterates this point again and again. 
And not only did that, he did that, but he, he loved the brothers and sisters in Jesus. And he preached the gospel again and again and again. And here is Paul, and he's telling them to do what he did. He's drilling in his own lifestyle into these believers. Now from this, I want to draw out a principle for us. And so here's the big principle that we need to own and cherish. God produces extraordinary results through ordinary and mundane means. So God ex produces extraordinary results through ordinary and mundane means. And this is so helpful for us to think about because this makes sense of the ways and works of God among us. Just, just think about us right now. God is doing something great in our midst. In fact, he's doing something so great in our midst that it outstrips all of the spectacles in redemptive history. What is taking place now? Think about what's going on in our present age as the gospel is going forward. We find things like the new birth. We think like conversion and faith and repentance and justification and sanctification. All of these things and all of these things going on right now is greater than, than what took place in the days of Moses or David or Joshua when seas were split and, and buildings crumbled and, and towns crumbled. And we ask, well, how does God do these extraordinary things? Great things are happening among us, and how does God do it? Well, he does it through the mundane and the ordinary. Just even in our assembly right now, in our congregation, great wonders and miracles are at work if you have the eyes of faith to see them. God is working right now as these words are, are preached. He is taking them and he's pressing them upon our hearts with his spirit. He's changing and transforming us from one degree of glory to another. God is at work in our singing, in our praying. He's encouraging us and building us up and fortifying us in the faith. And as we move forward in the service and go to the table where we're going to find a cup and some bread, we can trust that God will be working there as well. Now think about all that's going on in our service today. Preaching, praying, singing, eating, drinking, none of it is all that extraordinary. It's ordinary, it's normal, it's mundane, it's everyday stuff. There's just a guy standing behind a metal pulpit. There's just us in this room singing. There's just some bread and some cups on a table. But hear this, God in his wisdom has decided to carry out his global plans of salvation through what? Through these ordinary and normal and mundane matters. God is taking the world for himself through these very things. And this helps us as Christians. Helps us understand what's going on here, but it helps us understand our lives. So I want to drill further down here. So there's a temptation that we all must resist. The temptation is this. It is easy to become discontent with the lot that God has given you. It's easy to become discontent with the lot that God has given you. It's easy to become discontent with the mundane and the ordinary. Now, this temptation of discontentment comes in many different forms. So two examples. First example, you're a stay-at-home mom. And what do you do? You spend your time changing dirty diapers, doing laundry, and making meal after meal after meal. And so you're in the midst of your routine, you're in the midst of the ordinary and the mundane, and temptation comes in. Discontentment starts to speak something like this. Certainly, mom, there has to be something more for you in this life. There has to be something of more worth and value for Christ and his kingdom. There has to be a greater way to glorify God's great name in this world. Or another example, you're a normal workaday guy. And what you do is you go out and you do your job and you do the same job every day and you do that same job every day for years, day after day after day. And in the midst of the routine, discontentment creeps in and it says something like this. If you did something different with your life, Maybe if you quit your job, packed up your bag, sold your stuff, crossed an ocean, then your life would actually count for something. You'd be valuable to God and his kingdom. You could actually do something for God's glory. As we think about these temptations, they, they come in all sorts of forms, tailor-made for our lives. But hear this. Paul refuses to give in to these temptations. He says to you this morning, this is the word of God, love one another, live quietly, mind yourself, work. 
What is Paul doing? He is refusing to let Christians live, seeking out the grass that is greener on the other side of the fence. Instead, he calls Christians to focus in upon the lot that God has given them. Why does Paul do this? Well, Paul recognizes something about the mundane and the ordinary lives that we all live. He recognizes this. The mundane and ordinary work that God gives us is not a hindrance to his mission or his glory. Rather, they are the very means through which God accomplishes his mission in this world and glorifies his great name. We can go back to those examples and and try to work this out better. So we can go back to the stay-at-home mom. There's the dirty diapers, there's the laundry, there's the meals. After one, after another, after another, they never stop. Hear this, these things are not a hindrance to the mission of God or God's glory. Rather, they are the mission, they're the means of the mission of God's kingdom. In fact, they are a way through which God glorifies his great name in this earth. And if you do them in faith for the sake of Christ and his kingdom, none of what you do, not a single diaper, not a single meal is wasted. It is all for good and God will bless it. Or for the workaday guy. Think about the shifts and the hours and all of the work and the monotony of it all, doing it again and again and again. But hear this, none of it is a hindrance to the mission of God and none of it is a hindrance to God's glory in this world. Rather, they are the means of God's mission and they are a means through which God will glorify his name in this world. And if you do your work in faith for the sake of Christ and his kingdom, God will bless it. He'll bless it for good. And this should meet us with encouragement. Hear this, brother and sister in Jesus. You are not settling for second best if your life is full of the mundane and the ordinary. You are not a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God if these four commands are your life day after day after day. Hear this. The normal, ordinary Christian life is a life of dignity and worth. In fact, this is how the Thessalonian church became the Thessalonian church that we know from chapters one through three, what did they do? They loved and they lived quietly and they minded themselves and they worked and they worked and they worked and they did all of this in faith for the sake of Christ and his kingdom and what God did was this, he blessed it. He blessed it and he built up a people and a mission there that affected the whole region of Macedonia and Achaia. And so brothers and sisters in Jesus, God's word meets you today, right now. He says this to you, love one another, live quietly, mind yourself, work. And our God is so kind because in these words, he is helping us. He is showing us something. First of all, he is showing us how he works in this world. He works through the mundane and the ordinary. And as God takes up the mundane and the ordinary, he blesses it and advances his reign. We also see something else in these four commands. We see that our God is encouraging us. If we take up the normal and the ordinary with faith for the sake of Christ and his kingdom, God's gonna bless it. He's gonna bless it. And so we find insight, we find encouragement. But I want to show you one more thing in this text before we're done. And so would you look at your Bible and look at verse 11. And so at the, in verse 11, at the end of it, Paul adds this little phrase to his instructions. He says, as we instructed you, as we instructed you. Now, this is an important little phrase. Paul is telling us here with these words that living an ordinary and normal life is really difficult to do. Let me put it like this. When Paul first brought the gospel to the city of Thessalonica, He taught these new Christians how to live in light of the gospel of Jesus, in light of the good news that Jesus is the king. And he told them, he preached to them, love one another, live quietly, mind yourself, work. And he not only told them, preached to them, but he modeled this with his own life. He lived before them as an illustration of Christian living. And his living said this to them, love one another, live quietly, mind yourself, work. But Paul didn't stop there. Paul had to move out of Thessalonica because of persecution. And a little later, Paul sent one of his workers, Timothy, back to the city to encourage them. And we can be sure that Timothy came with this sort of encouragement, love one another, live quietly, mind yourself, work. But catch this, 
Paul keeps going. In yet another communication, we have the letter of 1 Thessalonians open in front of us. Paul presses these instructions on these believers again. He says, love one another, live quietly, mind yourself, work. What is Paul doing? He is repeating the same thing over and over and over again. And from the sheer repetition, we can understand that these instructions, from the perspective of Paul, as he was dealing with these people, were a challenge. Living a normal and ordinary life with faith for the sake of Christ and his kingdom is hard work. And so Paul does what? He reminds them and encourages them again and again and again. And so there's something here for us. We too ought to expect that these instructions are going to be hard and difficult. And because of that, we're going to need to hear them again and again and again. Love one another. Live quietly. Mind yourself work. And because of this, the difficulty in this, I want to set before you three challenges to to push you into it. Push you into it. So here are three challenges. First challenge is this. Brothers and sisters in Jesus, you must increase in love. Look at verses 9 and 10. Paul writes, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that is indeed what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. And so we see in these two verses that these believers had a reputation for love. They were known for it. Paul could see it. He is, he's rejoicing over it. And we can say that this wasn't a, a sentimental sort of love. This was a practical sort of love. Thessalonica was the leading city in their region, And very likely, Christians from other parts of the region would would travel through Thessalonica. And what these Christians would have done when they met these other brothers and sisters traveling through their city is they would have what? They would have opened up their house, they would have fed them, and gave them a place to sleep. And so these Christians loved through hospitality, not only through hospitality, but these, these works of the Christian church as they were spreading throughout the region, they were experiencing all sorts of persecution. And so what the Thessalonians likely did is they not only provided hospitality, hospitality but they opened up their wallets and began to, to help suffering brothers and sisters in Jesus, giving aid. And we also can be sure they're doing something else in love. They're doing what Paul did. And what did Paul do for the church? He prayed for the church continually. And these brothers and sisters would have done the very same thing. And at what Paul wants, as he notes their love, he takes notice of it, I see it, he wants more. He aims for an increase, he wants more hospitality, more financial generosity, more prayer for the saints. And so he says in verse 11, but we urge you brothers to do this more and more. So here's the challenge. Make an increase in love. Make an increase in love. And because we're talking about the mundane and the ordinary, we have to be practical. And so when I say make an increase in love, I mean this. Make an increase in hospitality. How can you better leverage your home for other Christians? God has given you a table and furniture. How can you better leverage those things for other believers in Jesus? God has given you food. He's given you a fridge and a pantry and cupboards and there's likely food all over the place. How can you better leverage your food for the sake of believers in Jesus? Where can you make an increase? And when I say make an increase in love, I mean make an increase in financial generosity. God has given to us money. He's given to us money, and I ask, how can you better use the money, the dollars that God has given you to meet the needs of other brothers and sisters in Jesus? Where can you meet a a need for fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus? Where can you make an increase? And when I say make an increase in love, I mean make an increase in prayer. How can you carry more of the needs, more of the concerns, more of the burdens of your brothers and sisters to God in prayer? Where can you make an increase? an increase. And so that's the first challenge. Increase in love. Increase in love. Second challenge. You must disentangle your life. You must disentangle your life. So in verse 12, this comes after the four commands that Paul gives us. We find Paul's rationale for why he's giving these commands. He writes this. 
so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So here in verse 12, Paul is putting his finger on a particular problem he sees at work in Thessalonica, something called the the patron-client relationship. So patrons, who are they? It's a strange word. Well, patrons were these wealthy, rich, prosperous people. And what patrons wanted to do in Thessalonica is they wanted to attract clients to them, and they wanted clients, why? Because if you got clients around you, these clients would spend their time promoting your name to others. They would win friends for you. And so the patron wanted to collect clients, and the clients then would spread your name, and as they spread your name, you'd be worked up the social ladder in power and nobility and honor. And the attraction of becoming a client to a patron was this. The patron would provide for you a living, your food, your clothing, perhaps somewhere to live. Instead of having to work with your hands like the artisans had to do, going out and working hard and sweating like Paul did, you could gain a living by simply promoting your patron, being a PR man or woman. But here is Paul, and he wants these Christians to disentangle their lives from this whole relationship. And it isn't too hard to see why he would want to do this. Just think about it. If you're living on the take, you're receiving an income without having to work for it, what happens? We have all sorts of free time that you normally wouldn't have if you had to work with your hands, sweating for your money. And if you have free time, you become a busybody, and then you're not minding your own affairs. You're minding everybody else's affairs. Even worse, you have time to flirt with all sorts of sins. But even worse, and I think Paul is very concerned about this, if you're on the take, you're compromised. If you get your living from a patron, you had better do the will of the patron, and if you don't do the will of the patron, what might happen to your food and your clothing and your place to live? You might not have it anymore. And so who has influence over you? Well, it might not be King Jesus, It might be this rich patron, and you might end up doing his will and not King Jesus' will. Now, as we think about it, we've got patron-client relationship. We don't really have that in our day. But I do think Paul's words help us in two meaningful ways. So we're going to take this challenge in two different directions. First challenge, first direction to take this challenge is this. You must labor to disentangle your life from dependence on income that you did not work for or in any meaningful way contribute towards. So Paul would counsel in our day, if you live off the the largesse, for example, of the government, you should labor to disentangle your life from that. Paul would counsel in our day, if you're constantly living off the generosity of other people, you should labor to the best of your ability to disentangle your life from that and provide something for yourself and for others. If you are dreaming about winning the lottery and and getting this big payday, Paul would counsel you, stop dreaming about that. Instead, get to work and provide something for yourself and for others. So that's the first direction. Disentangle your life from dependence on income that you didn't earn. Second direction would be this. You must labor to disentangle your life from debt. From debt. We live in a society choked by debt. Home loans, car loans, personal loans, student loans, payday advances, credit cards, all of it. Everything in our day can be bought on credit. Hardly any money down, but you just rack up the credit and you get what you want right away. But Paul would counsel us to disentangle your life from credit so that you're not controlled by such a thing. Now there's good reason to do this, to disentangle our lives from these things. When you are all tangled up in these things, guess what? You are unable to carry out the commands of the Christian life. For example, when you're tangled up in debt, your resources are consumed and eaten by what? By your debt service. After all the payments, after all the interest, there's little left to give away. There's little left to serve each other. And when it comes to living off an income you didn't earn, the sad fact stares you in the face. You don't actually have really much of anything to give away for the sake of others. And this is such an interesting way to read this because what Paul is doing is he's talking about our financial lives and he's talking about in a way that our financial lives are not just something personal hidden away from the life of the church, but our financial lives actually influence the life of the church. When God's people are living in dependence on others, it actually hampers the life of the church. And so Paul counsels the church to to disentangle their lives from this patron-client relationship 
And we need to disentangle our lives from income we didn't earn and from debt. And this brings us to a last challenge. And Paul challenges us with this. Brother and sister in Jesus, work diligently. So our God is sovereign, and that is such a good truth. And in his sovereignty, he assigns different lots to each one of us. To one, he gives certain tasks and duties and responsibilities, and to another, he gives other tasks, duties, and responsibilities. Some duties are heavier, some are lighter, some come with more prominence, some are done in obscurity. But here's the thing. God is sovereign, and he is okay distributing things differently to each other. And so here's the challenge. You must work diligently at what God has given to you. To you. God has given you a lot in this life. And your job isn't to complain about your lot or spend your time wishing you had another sort of lot or thinking about the lot that your friend might have. Rather, you must do the work with diligence, the the lot that God has given you, refusing to be slack or lazy or disinterested, pursuing it as the call of God, pursuing it with diligence as the very work of God that God has given you. For this is the call of God, and Paul makes this so clear. Verse 11, he says, Aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you. So there's the three challenges. Paul is challenging us and we need it. And as we think about these challenges and the four commands and the four verses, none of it is all very exciting. It's all mundane. It's all ordinary. But this this is exactly the point where we have to put faith to work. God has given us the mundane and ordinary. That's our lives. But what do we need to do? We need to take it up in faith, doing it all for the sake of Christ and his kingdom, believing. This is the work of faith. Believing that God will use it for good. Our good, the church's good, God's kingdom good, God's glory good. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for these four verses, we need their instruction in our lives. We do confess that we often grow discontent with the lot that you have given us and we ask that you would forgive us and now we ask that you would give us faith so that we might pursue the work that you have given us and we pray your blessing on it all, that you would bless our work. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.